the recording service to turn on, which it just did. And uh, with that, we will kick it off. So again, we always thank everyone for their uh, gracious time in listening to our commentary and a look back on what exactly happened uh, in North American equity markets in, uh, in every quarter. And this will be Q4 and a bit of a longer term look, look back for the full year of 2017. Uh, we do have these calls every single quarter, usually um, 10 to 12 business days after the quarter end. Uh, anything you see in this presentation, of course, as a CPMS client, you're, you're free to use in your own commentaries. Uh, if you need a soft copy of the slide deck with editable slides, please feel free to reach out to us directly. We're, we're more than thrilled to uh, provide that to you for your own, uh, for your own use. Again, my name is Ian Tam. Um, I am from the Morningstar CPMS team in Toronto. Um, for those on the call, I think I've talked to many of you before, and uh, we'll get going. So. Um, we always start with Canada, uh, not for any particular reason, but uh, just because we are based in Toronto. And every quarter we tend to do the exact same thing, just as a very consistent uh, look through on what exactly happened over the quarter. So today we'll be going through uh, what happened in the broad market, what were some of the best sectors and stocks, and also some of the worst sectors and stocks. We're going to look at some uh, single factor analysis, so focusing in on which specific fundamental equity factors contributed to the return, or at least give us, gives us a hint of what factors worked and, of course, what factors didn't work so well uh, over Q4 and over 2017. Lastly, we'll bit of a, do a bit of a macro look through on what the fundamentals are telling us about equities in general uh, and also equities versus the, uh, the bond market. So we'll start with Canada and that will uh, follow immediately with the, with the U.S. market. So uh, just looking through to our main index in Canada, the TSX total return uh, composite, uh, here is the returns over Q4, so a nice uh, solid 6% return. Uh, certainly a bit of weakness in Q2, down 2.4%, but uh, finishing the year strong at uh, 6%. This is just the price return. Uh, the total return index uh, gave us about 9.1% if you included dividends uh, over the year. Just wanted to contrast that, contrast that momentarily to what we saw in 2016. Uh, we saw a 20 plus percent return in 2016, uh, really primarily driven through the commodity markets, uh, oil and materials. Uh, frankly, a bit of a junky market when fundamentals didn't really work too well. Uh, last year, we saw the dangerous portfolio outperforming uh, the actual index itself. Uh, so we're thankful that in 2017, uh, that didn't repeat. So uh, we saw some of the companies with, with pretty good growth metrics uh, float near the top. And of course, dangerous uh, continues to underperform the index in Canada. So we're certainly thrilled to see that. Um, if you were to look at uh, our picture of small caps versus large caps, typically in the bull market, you'll see that small caps tend to outperform large caps. That wasn't the case in 2017. Uh, the TSX 60, the bigger companies re returned 9.8%, uh, smaller companies returned 2.8%, so that small cap index, uh, it's a bit of a weaker performance over the year, uh, primarily due to the weaker performance in Q2 where it was down 5.5%. Uh, and of course, it takes a bit of time to recover from that. So overall, uh, Composite was up 9.1%, which we're happy with on a total return basis, uh, with small caps uh, underperforming large caps, which isn't typical in a bull run like this. Uh, taking a look at the market breadth, and then just as a quick reminder, market breadth represents the percentage of stocks showing a positive return over a given period. So look, if you look over the full year uh, on the large cap space, uh, almost 80%, 70%, or another way to put that is four out of five large cap stocks in Canada uh, showed a positive return. Uh, if you look at the broader composite index, about two-thirds showed a positive return, and uh, in the small cap space, about 60% showed a positive return uh, over the quarter. If we took a, take a look deeper into the individual sectors, uh, I always start this slide with a comment about the way the TSS Composite uh, benchmark is constructed. It, it's heavily skewed, of course, towards uh, three sectors, of course, financials, materials, and energy. Uh, those three together make up almost 40% of our index. So definitely a very skewed benchmark towards those three sectors, unlike the U.S., which is a lot more diversified across the economy. That being said, um, a couple of things that jumped out at me over this quarter, uh, of course, a big, uh, probably a lot of uh, client conversations are around um, marijuana stocks, so cannabis growth in particular. Um, that particular stock uh, bumped up about 177% over, over the quarter. Uh, now, I just want to 
kind of keep in mind, uh, healthcare in Canada has always been a very concentrated sector, and on a market cap or market flow basis, it's a very slim portion of the, of the composite index. Uh, at the end of Q4, um, healthcare made up about 1%. Uh, and canopy growth uh, was actually the, the ticker is weed, uh, was at that index in March of 2017. So I have a couple, a slide next that I'll show you how that correlation uh, kind of breaks out, but I just wanted to make it a point that even though a lot of people are talking about canopy growth and that whole uh, sub-industry, I guess, um, it still makes up a very, very small percentage of our, our market today. Uh, but that being said, uh, a lot of the, the bigger contributor would be uh, financials up 5.7%, and of course, with such a large weighting in the index, that'll affect the overall market return. Uh, consumer staples, uh, also of note, uh, up 6.2%. 6, 6 a uh, few of the names I wanted to point out here, uh, Couchetard uh, certainly tends to screen well on, on many of our strategies, um, as does Bombardier if you're more value focused. Another great Canadian story here, Canada Goose Holdings, which went uh, public pre pretty recently, has done very well. Uh, certainly a great Canadian story in the retail space. Uh, on, the, on the negative side, uh, Torex Gold was our, our biggest loser over the, uh, over the quarter. If you look at the full year, uh, so not just Q4, but all of 2017, uh, pretty much all sectors showed positive returns with the exception of energy, and of course energy is tied very closely to oil prices. Um, and I wanted to also point out Empire, Empire um, companies uh, showed a 58% return. If you do use some of the CPMS screening methodology, can, uh, Empire does tend to screen very well on more conservative uh, strategies, so yield focus, low beta, low volatility, a uh, great name for us on, on that piece. Uh, if you're kind of more growth focused, Shopify does tend to screen very well on the more aggressive strategies, showing ROEs or uh, reinvestment back into the company. Uh, so a couple of names that we're pretty happy with over, uh, over 2017. Uh, if you look uh, a bit even even longer term, <clears throat> here are some of the, the five-year growth metrics or five-year performance metrics, I should say, across all the sectors. Uh, so with the exception of energy uh, and healthcare, over the three-year return, uh, everything looks, looks positive, and over the five-year materials and healthcare uh, show negative. Um, I did want to point out the reversal that we noticed uh, in energy specifically. So 2016, of course, a great rally in, in oil prices, up 35%, and then right away, 2017, uh, down, 17, uh, down 7 percent. Same thing with healthcare, uh, pretty lackluster year in 2016. Again, it's a very concentrated set of companies. Uh, and then in 2017, a nice positive return in healthcare. So a couple of reversals there that I wanted to point out. Uh, just as a quick reminder, <clears throat> here is the uh, energy sector in Canada, again, a very big chunk of our, of our index. Uh, and then in the green line is the uh, dollar or price, price of uh, Brent crude or price of oil. Over that same time, you can see, of course, this is very, very highly corre correlated. And this, again, relates to the reversal of, of trend in 2016-2017 uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, our, in our oil index in Canada or energy index in Canada. Uh, going back to the whole um, marijuana buzz, I guess, that's, that's been happening in Canada, uh, I did want to point out that the healthcare index, uh, it does appear to be heavily correlated with that one stock. It gets one out of seven stocks in an index. Uh, uh, canopy growth was added to the composite in uh, the middle of March, so you can see before that there's not really, uh, I had a longer term chart, but I took, out, took it out. Um, it's not a it's, a, it's a recent addition to that index. So, of course, that big bump uh, caused uh, post-March kind of gives you a correlation between that one stock and the broader healthcare index. So, um, you know, you can have your own opinion on that, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily say it's representative of the whole healthcare sector in, in Canada. <clears throat> Uh, this is our kind of, in a way, it's kind of a look-ahead slide. If you looked at all the Q1, so the current quarter we're in, uh, if you look at all the Q1s over the last 60 years, uh, on average, Q1 returns about 3.7%. Uh, so, again, we're not saying that's going to happen this quarter. It's just a historical statistical look back on what typically happens in Q1. Uh, about 80% of the time over all the Q1s in the last 60 years, uh, we show a positive return uh, in the index. Breaking it out into the sectors, uh, typically real estate and uh, IT or uh, uh, the tech stocks and consumers post bigger gains in Q1, but again, this is just based on historical data, about 30 years worth of history. Uh, typically, those are the three sectors that have posted larger uh, returns um, in, in Q1. So, 
Looking into the best and worst performers, again, the, the intent of this is to try to pick out some of the fundamental characteristics of best and worst performers to give us a hint of which factors worked uh, over Q4, and in this case, uh, over 2017 as well. So looking through to looking at Q4, uh, backwards looking view, um, here are the best performing stocks based on the three month total return at the end of last year. Um, typically you'll see uh, a smattering of different uh, sectors. Uh, other times you'll see a very uh, focused uh, list of stocks in energy or materials. Uh, this quarter we saw a pretty, uh, pretty reasonable distribution of stocks that performed really well across most sectors in, in Canada. Uh, again, in the healthcare sector, although uh, some of these aren't in the, uh, in the actual index, a couple of cannabis stocks do show up near the top, uh, certainly a lot of buzz around that. Uh, and then uh, certainly in materials, uh, there are some pretty good gainers as well, uh, lithium, uh, lithium names in particular, um, I'm guessing with the demand of, of rechargeable batteries, uh, they, they did really well in Q4 as well. <clears throat> Now, uh, this is where the meat and potatoes of our analysis happens. Uh, as a quick reminder, what we do for this chart is we take those same 50 stocks, we rewind the tape to the beginning of Q4, and on the left-hand side, we try to outline the characteristics of those 50 stocks on an equally weighted basis against the broad index or the TSS composite. So if you were to look straight down this line, uh, the, the neutral line, I guess, would be the, the TSS composite, and then the green and red bars indicate how many standard deviations away is that portfolio uh, away from the index. So I'll read one line to you. It'll be pretty obvious what we're trying to do here. Uh, so those 50 stocks that we were just looking at, the best performing stocks at the beginning of the quarter showed a price to book metric uh, slightly lower than the uh, benchmark index. Uh, so the left hand side of this chart is the beginning of the quarter and the right hand side is the characteristics of those same 50 stocks at the end, end of the quarter. So what we noticed about these 50 stocks is that at the beginning of the quarter they had higher earnings variability and beta. So uh, if you do have a lower volatility strategy that you're running with CPMS, probably would not have picked up any of those names. Uh, they had negative earnings surprise and estimate revisions, so analysts were quite bearish in terms of revisions on, um, on those 50 names, uh, and uh, they were not uh, beating expectations either, at least going into Q4. Uh, they did show some lower valuations on a price to cash flow, price to sales, and price to book basis. Uh, and profitability-wise, uh, they didn't look that great relative to the market. One thing that we always look at is the, uh, the, the price momentum as well. So you'll notice at the very bottom of this chart, at the beginning of the quarter, uh, those 50 stocks were actually exhibiting negative price momentum. Uh, so there's a bit of reversal that happened there. Of course, at the end of the quarter, they all showed positive price momentum. So that doesn't always happen, uh, but uh, in this case, you'll, you'll see that there was a reversal in, in those names in particular. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, here are the 50 worst performing stocks on a, on a total return basis over Q4. Of course, we see a lot of energy and a lot of materials names, gold in particular, um, really concentrated in those two, those two sectors and then the smattering across the other, uh, the other strategies, or sorry, the other, uh, the other um, sectors, uh, just over Q4. Uh, and then, if you look at the characteristics of those stocks, you'll see, uh, again, a couple of key traits. Uh, they were, on average, ha they had higher leverage, so, uh, sorry, lower leverage, so lower debt to equity ratio. I should correct that slide before I send it out. Uh, poor estimate revisions. Uh, they also look reasonably valued relative to the broad index. Uh, they did show very high short-term earnings growth, so QEM, quarterly earnings momentum, is one of those metrics that we see in a lot of our uh, strategies. Uh, unfortunately, that metric wasn't rewarded over Q4. Um, analysts were also very bullish on the growth projections on these companies. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't, uh, they weren't quite accurate with these 50 stocks in particular. And then at the very bottom, you'll see that uh, going into the quarter, uh, they did exhibit negative or uh, negative price momentum, and of course, that continued on over, over Q4. So, um, Going further into our factor analysis, uh, this next section in our presentation goes through uh, what we call a single variable test. So the concept with single variable test is we take a single factor, just for example, PE ratio, so stocks with the lowest PE, and at the beginning of the quarter, we simply pick a basket of the 50 best stocks 
on that one particular measure, and we uh, essentially measure the, uh, the performance of that basket over the quarter. And what we, we do that for about 50 of the, uh, or sorry, about uh, across most of our commonly used metrics in our strategies. And this is basically a ranking of the factors uh, based on the performance of that factor in a 50 stop portfolio over, over the quarter. So when you look down this list, uh, again, just want to reiterate here, if you had picked stocks strictly based on three-month price change at the beginning of the quarter and held those stocks, that portfolio would have returned 16.7%. Same thing with all the other factors. If I had picked just based on highest yield, I would have returned 2.4% on the portfolio uh, over Q4. So what did I notice here? Um, combination of momentum factors tended to perform very well, uh, analyst expectations and growth, and uh, ironically, stocks with uh, lower current ratio, so good cash management, uh, seem to perform well over Q4. Uh, tied to the story of, of uh, low volatility, stocks with a higher yield um, did not do quite as well over Q4. Again, in a momentum market, uh, stocks with uh, income-focused or conservative models will just not do quite as well as, as the rest of the market in, in that kind of a scenario. So no surprises there. Uh, if you look at the full year over 2017, uh, a couple of patterns we noticed. Um, <clears throat> Price to sales was our top performing factor. So again, if you had just picked stocks with the lowest price to sales at the beginning of Q1, uh, picked them again in Q2, Q3, and Q4, the total return in 2017 is 25%. So again, it is a bull market. Uh, the market's up substantially. Uh, so a lot of these factors did pretty well. Uh, current ratio uh, was, uh, was a reasonable metric as well. She seemed to exhibit positive uh, momentum. <clears throat> and ROE uh, in Canada continues to be an effective factor uh, with um, picking stocks with high ROE, giving you a return of 24% on a standalone basis. Uh, going a bit further down the list, uh, some of the deeper valuation metrics like price to book, uh, price to cash flow, uh, did not reward investors. So if you had only picked super cheap stocks based on those two, uh, those two factors, uh, you probably would have returned negative over, over the year. Um, in this next section, we talk about all of our models. So these are the CPMS in-house models, or if you use CPMS desktop, they're called predefined models. Uh, about half of our uh, strategies did better than the TSX over Q4, and half did worse. Uh, of course, I wanted to point out the performance of Dangerous. Um, we're certainly happy what Dangerous is at the bottom of the list, where it's supposed to be. Again, Dangerous is a strategy that looks for over-leveraged stocks with shrinking earnings and, in general, just deteriorating fundamentals. Uh, it was designed as a short strategy or a contrarian strategy, and it's designed to underperform the market. Again, just as a quick reminder, 2016, Dangerous actually outperformed the market. So there are certain uh, time periods, uh, three, three time periods, three calendar years over the last 30, where Dangerous has outperformed, uh, and that's typically when our more fundamentally based uh, models don't perform quite as well. So we're, we're certainly thankful that Dangerous is at the bottom of that list, exactly where it's supposed to be. Uh, earnings value and predictable growth were the uh, biggest gainers. Uh, yeah, they're, they're both kind of garpy style strategies with uh, double-digit returns in Q4, almost doubling the index. If you look at the full year 2017, uh, about again, about half of our strategies outperformed the index, earnings value, value, asset growth, predictable growth. Uh, these all showed 20 plus percent return over, over the full year. Uh, dividend growth, although conservative in nature, it did uh, squeak by with a, uh, about a 1% uh, alpha over the composite. Um, but again, it is a more conservative strategy, so it's not designed to do nearly as well as some of the faster, more aggressive strategies like uh, asset growth or predictable growth. Um, dangerous over the full year, um, again, uh, returned negative 7.4% uh, with momentum um, picking, uh, uh, again, at the, at the bottom of that list. And then momentum, again, all, all of our strategies tend to be pretty, pretty concentrated, so between 20 and, and 40 stocks. Uh, momentum happened to uh, have some of the, the, the poorer, poorer metrics in there, uh, which underperformed the market uh, this year substantially. Um, 
Taking a look at the broader picture in Canada, uh, we always look at this chart. It's uh, kind of our what you pay versus what you get chart. Uh, what you pay is, is, is value, so uh, that's the, the, the red line here, and that essentially measures the median price to book in the Canadian CPMS universe. Today that universe consists of about 710 stocks, or about 98% of market cap in Canada. Uh, the story here is that valuations have been pushed steadily downwards up until mid-2015. Uh, and of course, 2016 bull uh, jump rally brought that right up. Now, if you compare the price of book uh, right now, which is about 1.6 times, it's not far off from kind of your long-term average. If you exclude kind of extreme examples like 2008, 2009, when valuations were all over the place, uh, 1.6 times kind of relates to uh, what we saw between uh, the late 90s and just before the subprime crisis and a little bit before that as well. Um, as you know, Canada is very cyclical. We're really focused on those commodities, uh, so that's why this chart looks a bit more volatile. So that's what you pay. That's the value that you're, you're paying for. Uh, what you get in return is profitability. So that blue line at the top is the median ROE net of T-bills. So we, we strip out the interest rate effects uh, as the Bank of Canada tends to, as they increase rates, um, companies will have to be more profitable to maintain that, uh, that blue line. So uh, in terms of profitability, we did see a bit of a dip uh, in 2016, 2015, 2016, but that's actually gone back up. Um, ROE is still holding pretty steady at uh, about 3% ROE on the median stock in, in Canada. So the trend there is uh, fairly positive, I think, in our opinion. Uh, and we're not looking like we're overvalued or anything like that, uh, which you'll see is a bit of a different story in the U.S. market. If you look at the aggregate earnings, uh, there's two lines on this page. Uh, they represent kind of the same thing. One's, a, one's an average and one's a median. Uh, but the aggregate earnings uh, year-over-year growth rate uh, is in positive territory, the, the, regardless of how you look at it, median or average. Uh, the projections for growth rate, which is the dotted lines in the circle, uh, look like they're going to be even higher uh, for, for next year. Uh, so certainly positive there. Uh, if you look at the aggregate earnings uh, for the TSS Composite, you can see it's, it's uh, kind of on, the, on a trend upwards and it's rising at a faster rate. So the year-over-year -year growth rate is rising and the actual earnings per share for the Composite Index is also rising. Here's a chart of the, our, our estimate revisions and earnings surprises. So um, it's no surprise here. Analysts, once they release a target or an earnings per share estimate, they do, t in, in Canada in particular, uh, we do tend to revise downwards more than we revise upwards. So that red line is basically a snapshot of today's consensus estimate versus what it was three months ago. And the, you can see over the long term, it's typically negative because typically analysts do revise downwards and not upwards. So I wouldn't say it's more negative than it was in previous quarters. Um, and then the blue line is your earnings surprise. So if you take the, uh, the average earnings surprise over the full universe, it's typically neutral or about 0%. So some, some, uh, some stocks surprising positively, some stocks surprising negatively, uh, nothing of note over this quarter. Um, pretty, pretty neutral in terms of earnings surprise. Uh, looking ahead at the expectations from the street for uh, 2018. Um, again, no, no, don't be uh, shocked by the estimate revision figures here. Analysts tend to revise downwards and not upwards in Canada. Um, but in terms of what their expectations are, uh, across most sectors except for healthcare, uh, analysts are expecting a positive growth rate in earnings uh, for 2018. Uh, and with that, the expected ROE also looks like it's positive for pretty much every sector except for healthcare. Um, perhaps due to the higher valuations in healthcare right now, the uh, price to book in healthcare is about 5.8 times, so certainly higher than, than the other sectors. Uh, the biggest uh, number on the screen is uh, expected ROE for telecommunications, so telcos uh, analysts are projecting to have the highest profitability in 2018, as it stands now. Uh, looking uh, looking into uh, our income-focused investors, so the debate has been, of course, uh, do you buy a 10-year bond or do you buy a dividend yield portfolio? Both will give you income. Um, as bank rates start to creep up, that spread between uh, buying a dividend portfolio or buying uh, the index and getting yields from that index is starting to narrow. Um, it, equities are still giving you slightly more yield uh, than, than, than a 10-year bond. Uh, but again, that, that spread starting to, to narrow just a bit as uh, bank increases rates. 
terms of the economy, uh, unemployment as uh, in Canada uh, looks like it's at an all-time low, pretty much at 2000 and, uh, pre-2008 levels. Uh, inflation has crept up uh, at about 2%, which is kind of in line with the bank target between 1% and 3%. Uh, capacity utilization rate is, is consistent. Uh, in terms of the technicals, so again, we're not uh, big technical fanatics here at Morningstar CPMS. We tend to be more fundamental stock pickers. But if you had to look at a chart, uh, this is a very basic uh, chart of the TSS Composite versus its 50 and 200-day moving average. Uh, if you're a classical technician, you can see that the Composite is above its 50-day moving average, maybe creeping a little bit closer. Uh, if that line does cross, um, you know, the typical classical uh, technical training will tell you that once it crosses, it'll move more towards the 200-day moving average. So that's what technicals tell you today about, about Canada and the TSX in particular. So in summary, um, evaluations in Canada, if you look at that median price to book chart, uh, they have increased but are still in line with the long-term trend. Um, ROE is expected to increase uh, based on projections from the sell side in all sectors except for healthcare. Uh, analysts do expect to uh, expect companies to grow earnings in the upcoming quarter, except for healthcare. Uh, but estimate cuts are still consistent across all sectors, which is normal in Canada. Equity yields, in terms of the asset mix, equity yields are still slightly more compelling than the 10-year bond yields. But uh, bank bank rates are rising, as you know. Uh, we just talked about the technicals. Uh, TSX is trading above the 50 and above the 200, but crossing closely to the 50-day moving average. Uh, there's no capacity constraints uh, in, in Canada that are apparent. Unemployment rate is at all-time lows, and inflation is in line with targets. So pretty good picture for Canada so far, uh, and we're certainly happy with the nice returns uh, on the index uh, this, this year. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Dan, who will take you through the U.S. market. All right. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, so let's take a look at the U.S. market in the fourth quarter of 2017. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the same area, so we're going to talk briefly about market performance, uh, go over the best sectors and the stocks within those sectors. Uh, we're going to do a single factor analysis and model preference, just like Ian did for the Canadian markets. And last but not least, we're going to go into the uh, market fundamentals and the outlook. So taking a look at the performance of the S&P 500 in 2017, you'll see a gradual rise. You'll notice that the first and the fourth quarters um, had the largest returns, and uh, it was pretty much a trending, steady path in 2017. Uh, when we take a look at the different markets, um, over here we have the S&P 500, which is a large cap index, um, the S&P 400, which is uh, more midsize, and the S&P 600, which is a small cap. Uh, taking a look at those different indices, we'll notice that the NASDAQ and the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, were the top performing indices for 2017, and all the indices were up significantly for the year without a single losing quarter. The other thing I'd like you to pay attention to is the S&P 600. You'll notice that in 2017, uh, the performance was at 13 percent. Um, once again, very similar to what's going on in Canada in terms of uh, the market cap. So uh, the small cap has underperformed relative to the other indices. Taking a look at a market depth, uh, this is basically a measure of the percentage of stocks with a positive return. Uh, what we see is that more than 90% of the Dow Jones Industrial Average stocks and uh, three quarters of the S&P 500 were up during the fourth quarter. Um, for the year in 2017, um, four out of five stocks were up um, in the 500, and for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it's nine out of ten stocks that were up for uh, the year of 2017. Uh, taking that further, um, those types of uh, market breadth indicators uh, take us back all the way to 2014. So we haven't been at this level since 2014, uh, and we're creeping up just about uh, getting close to 80%, uh, which uh, hasn't uh, been seen since uh, 2013. So breaking it down, breaking down the 2017 numbers by sector, we can see that the highest performance for Q4 was the consumer discretionary sector. Um, we can also uh, pay attention to the different sector weights. Obviously, the S&P 500 is more fairly distributed. It's not as concentrated as the Canadian market. Uh, but you'll also notice that the information technology sector is almost 25% of the entire market. So just uh, something to keep in mind. Um, when it comes to the best performing stock, uh, we can see that L Brands was up 46%. Um, 
they basically made all of their gains within the, the fourth quarter. If you look at the yearly chart, they were down on the year up until the, uh, the end of the third quarter. Uh, so that was an interesting story. Um, and uh, on the losing side, in terms of worst performers, uh, PG&E Corp had its own share of problems. Uh, they had some wildfires that they had to deal with, as well as uh, uh, completely uh, suspending their dividend in December resulted in uh, further downside for that stock. Uh, taking a look at the yearly performance um, for these sectors, what we'll see is that information technology was up nearly 40%, and we had only two sectors that had negative returns. Those were energy and telecommunications. Um, you can also see that materials and consumer discretionary uh, led the way, and in terms of yearly performers, um, energy continued a strong story from 2016 and was up 133% for the year, whereas uh, range resources um, actually continued its decline from previous years and was down another 50%. You'll see some other uh, more common names in the best performers list that you might have heard um, across the news, like Micron Technologies or Wind Resorts, as well as Boeing Company. Uh, this is basically the same numbers, but in chart format, you'll see this is from the start of 2017 until the end of 2017. Uh, just a clearer picture, uh, we see that the technology sector has outperformed significantly for the year, and the two sectors uh, mentioned previously are pretty much break even, just under, uh, down under 1% for the year. Going into uh, the quarterly returns, um, first thing I'd like you to pay attention to is the reversal in the energy sector. You'll notice that the first half of the year it was down 6% uh, per quarter, and it almost made it uh, all the way back to break even, um, closing the year just under 1%. Once again, information technology was up 40%, but overall, um, we were down only, um, only two sectors were down for the year of 2017. So taking a look at the best and worst performers for the S&P 500, these are the top and bottom 50 stocks. So looking at this list, you can see that it's heavily concentrated within the consumer discretionary, as well as the IT sectors. On the consumer discretionary side, you can see names like uh, Dollar Tree, uh, Foot Locker, L Brands, which I mentioned earlier. And on the information technology, um, you can see names like Acme, Seagate, Qualcomm, pretty uh, blue chip stocks um, that you guys have obviously heard of. So taking a deeper dive into uh, the best performing stocks here, I know the you know the writing is a little bit small here, but just a couple of things to pay attention to in terms of attribution. So as Ian mentioned. Um, the vertical chart on the left-hand side is at the start of the fourth quarter, uh, what the attribution looked like at the start, and <laughs> similar chart on the right-hand side is at the end of the, first uh, of the fourth quarter. What you'll notice is that there was a strong tilt towards valuation metrics, so uh, P-E ratio, price to book, price to sales um, had a very strong tilt in terms of the best performing stocks. And which, what you'll notice at the bottom, very similar performance in terms of a reversal on the momentum uh, factors. Uh, so if you were actually uh, picking stocks based on um, how much, you know, how down they were in the beginning of the quarter, you'll notice that there was a reversal and you actually ended up making, making up all of those losses that they had. Looking at the 50 worst performing stocks, um, you'll notice that the concentration also surprisingly is within the consumer discretionary field, so obviously um, that sector had um, quite a bit of names in both uh, lists. And you'll notice that healthcare is, uh, has quite a chunky list as well on the 50 worst uh, performers, names like uh, Merck, Gilead, as well as Boston Scientific. Taking a look at the attribution for the 50 worst uh, performing stocks, you'll notice that a lot of them are smaller cap, smaller market cap, less liquid names. You can see that by uh, the red horizontal bars that are tilted to the left side. Um, a lot of them had more inexpensive valuation metrics. And, um, and our, the ROE metric, which is used across multiple models in, uh, uh, within CPMS, you'll notice that if you use that as a metric um, on, on uh, filtering out some of the names, then you stayed away pretty much from, from a lot of the losers. So taking a look at the historical performance for the first quarter, um, basically what we're looking at here, this is by no means forward-looking, uh, but what we're looking at is the history since 1971, Essentially, 70% of the time um, during the first quarter of the year, we've had an average of 
3.4% uh, return. So take that with a grain of salt, obviously, because it's not forward-looking, but just something to keep in mind as we are uh, well into Q1. Once again, breaking this down by the sectors, you'll notice that telecom is the only sector um, that is down during the first quarter. Um, this data tracks back all the way to 1990. Um, and basically, IT and consumer discretionary have been the best performing sectors as well as energy. And uh, telecom and utilities have historically been the two lagging sectors within the first quarter. So taking a look at the fundamentals, so pretty much the same exercise that Ian went through on the Canadian side. We're looking at an equally weighted 50 stock portfolio, and we've actually separated uh, by a single factor. So we took the best 50 stocks and we allocated it uh, to a single factor and we measured their performance. So if we take a look at the list here, in 2017, uh, many of the short and long-term growth and profitability metrics were rewarded. Uh, so ROE, top and bottom line momentum, as well as long-term earnings growth. You'll notice that the top one over there uh, variable is a net profit margin with a return of 26% as well as some long-term um, earnings and dividend growth metrics. On the reverse side, at the bottom of the list, you'll notice that we have a lot of the um, metrics that contain the analyst expectations. Now, while they still produce positive returns for the year on a standalone basis, um, they weren't nearly as effective as many of the other factors. So perhaps there wasn't enough time for these expectations to come into fruition, um, but maybe that'll change uh, for this year. So moving uh, towards the style analysis, taking a look at our models, we can see that overall in 2017, more than half of the CPMS models outperformed the benchmark with earnings growth and asset growth achieving the highest returns. And similar to Canada, dividend and income focused models un underperformed. What you'll notice as well, uh, which is very interesting and, and quite a bit different from what's going on in Canada, is the dangerous model was up 14.5%. Just goes to show that um, a lot of the stocks are just being bought up. Um, and as we, watched, as we walked uh, through the attribution model a second ago, we saw that momentum played a um, a huge role in that type of move higher. Taking a look at the market fundamentals and the outlook. So the same type of chart that we use for Canada, but now we're looking at the U.S. This is what Ian meant when it looks a little bit different on the U.S. side of things. We're looking at what you're paying versus what you're getting. Um, notice that the red line, which is the price to book ratio, uh, continues to climb higher and is at a level not seen since the late 90s while the ROE continues to trend lower since peaking several years ago. So essentially, um, you're paying more and you're getting it. And uh, that story doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon. Taking a deeper dive into the valuations, we're basically seeing that all the valuations um, that you see here on the chart, P, price to book, price to cash flow, as well as price to sales, are continuing to rise steadily with no signs of slowing down. In terms of the earnings picture, um, the earnings growth the year over year are positive and continuing to rise. Um, the little circles that you see on the right-hand side are the expectations, and those seem to be in line and no surprises are expected. Um, looking at this chart, what you'll see over here is the year over year earnings growth. The orange line indicates the S&P 500 earnings. Um, those earnings continue to grow in 2017, and the expectations for the year-over-year -year growth was coming in at just over 10%. Now, in terms of the uh, estimate revisions and the earnings surprise, uh, the earnings surprise continues to be positive, while the analysts are approaching uh, neutral territory in terms of their revisions. So what you'll notice is um, in the last uh, five to seven years or so, it tended to be a little bit more negative in terms of the estimate revisions, but we're creeping towards uh, neutrality over here, which is a pretty interesting story. And if we take a deeper look into that, those revisions, usually what you see over here on the right-hand side on this chart, most of it is usually negative, but it, uh, it looks like a mixed bag over here. So depending on the you <coughs> have positive estimate revisions, some of them have negative. Um, but basically, energy and telecom financials look like they're the cheapest sectors on a price-to-book valuation method, and uh, the analysts are expecting energy sector earnings to grow at the quickest pace, um, which is 43% uh, as you can see there on the top of the chart, 
and telecom earnings to decline. So telecom looks like it's the only sector that um, analysts are expecting EPS decline. Some other considerations that we like to look at and mention uh, at the end of the quarter is the asset mix decision. So equity dividend yields remain more than 50 basis points below the 10-year bond yield. Um, and what you'll notice that it has fluctuated quite a bit um, over the last decade since the financial crisis. But previous to the financial crisis, the chance was up, you'll notice that um, there was no time in history previous to this financial crisis where the S&P dividend yield was higher than the 10-year bond. So once again, we're not economists here, but uh, the picture speaks for itself. Um, unemployment continues to head lower and is at levels not seen since 2000. Um, inflation is hovering right around a 2% target rate, and the capacity utilization is gradually heading towards the high 70s, um, as it was back in 2012-2013. Uh, Taking a look at the consumer sector, um, the housing starts, retail sales, and the personal disposable income are continuing to trend higher. What you'll notice is the housing starts are coming back and still recovering from those 2009 lows whereas the retail sales and the personal disposable income are just trending upwards um, in a, at a steady pace. Taking a look at the technical picture here, um, what you'll notice is that S&P 500 is trading above its 50 and 200 day moving average and continues to trend higher. Um, as they say, the trend is your friend. Um, the S&P looks a little bit overextended because it's uh, further away from the 50. Um, but as long as we remain above those levels, um, the trend is your friend and just uh, um, optimism down ahead. Now, just summarizing some of the fundamentals here um, that, we've that we've looked at recently, um, the valuations continue to trend up with the price to sales stretched the furthest compared to historical norms. Um, in terms of profitability, there are improvements in ROE, um, and those improvements are expected across all sectors. In terms of the earnings growth, analysts are expecting growth in all sectors except for telecom uh, for the first quarter of the year, and the energy sector is seeing positive estimate revisions. The asset mix chart that we just looked at briefly, um, the income from the 10-year bond looks more attractive than the yields from the equities. That's the conclusion from that chart. And in terms of technical analysis, just like we touched on, uh, the moving averages are trending upwards while the index is trading above the shorter-term moving average. In terms of the economic analysis, um, the unemployment rate is at all-time lows, while the inflation is slightly higher than the target rate. Hey, thanks, Dan. Uh, so that being said, um, we did want to wrap up the presentation before we open it up for questions. And again, we do do this presentation every single quarter. And of course, when you, if you would like access to these slides to use in your own client presentations, please feel free to reach out to us directly. Uh, there's an email address here that goes to the whole team, as well as a 877 number that rings to the whole team here in Toronto. I did want to make a special mention that next month we will be doing uh, kind of a special workshop for all CPMS clients. Um, we have our guests from Sustainalytics coming into the office and we'll be introducing uh, some new factors that are available for purchase within CPMS and they relate to the whole idea of ESG or socially responsible investing. For those that don't know, Morningstar has actually entered into a partnership with Sustainalytics, which is one of the largest uh, ESG research firms in the world, and I'm very excited to be able to show that data or that all the uh, output of their analysis within in CPMS. Uh, this is uh, a topic that's been in high demand from uh, various clients across uh, Canada and the U.S. Uh, when, at least anecdotally, when we talk to when we talk to all of you, um, you know, as, as we have a, a rise in, uh, in millennial investors, uh, just in general, people are more conscious of, of what their their assets are doing. Uh, we do see a larger demand in, in this style of investing. So very excited to bring uh, our partners at Sustainalytics along for, uh, along for a presentation next month. So please look out in your emails for an invitation to, to that. Uh, this being said, I would like to, uh, I'm just going to uh, stop the recording and then uh, open it up for questions. So if you bear with me for just uh, a couple seconds here.